Hello and welcome to The Garden Log with me, Ben Dark. I am broadcasting to you from a wet and cold late November afternoon. It's a Thursday, so I'm not gardening today, thank goodness, because it really is quite horrible out there. I've been splashing through the, the streets looking at front gardens with my son this morning. Well, he hasn't, he hasn't looked very much, not as much as I'd like. He's 11 months old now. Um, but still not particularly interested in, in all of the crab apples hung with their baubles and the and the naked aces and the, the little box hedges that I was trying to point out. He's passed out now, so maybe maybe there was some excitement there, something for him to, to contemplate as he dreams his little dreams in the next room. I don't think I have to worry too much about talking loudly. Enough people tell me that this is the podcast for sending them to sleep. To, to be reassured that the mumblings from in here won't disturb him. Anyway, I'm warm and cosy, it's horrible outside, let's talk about the autumn. If you are particularly observant, you might notice that I said that I'm broadcasting from, from late November, and what I'm discussing this week, that sounds like jobs for early November. That sounds like jobs for a slightly less cold and frigid rain. Uh, you're very right. The the events in this week's episode happened a couple of weeks ago, but I just didn't get round to, to putting this out there until I got a lovely message from someone called Melanie. Melanie messaged me on the Ko-Fi platform and just reminded me that that I'm not just doing this for, for my own amusement. There are people out there as well who, who want to, to listen to the new episodes and who wait for them and, and who send, send lovely messages. So thank you very much and let's talk about the garden. This week I'm mainly talking about rearranging. Autumn is the perfect, perfect time for, for rearranging because everything that failed, everything that didn't work, is still foremost in the gardener's mind. In spring, you're too far away from, from all of those herbaceous catastrophes. You are back in the, in the drunk with new leaf phase. You'll be happy for anything, no matter where it comes up. As long as it's green, as long as it's not mud or mulch, you will be welcoming it. Whereas at this time of year, we can still say, oh my goodness, why on earth did I do that? Why did I plant those two things 30 centimetres apart where they could just inelegantly battle each other? Let me remember to move them. So this week's episode is all about those, those movements made, those beds reshaped, those trees hoiked indignantly from their, their beds and plopped in other parts of the garden. It really was a very good week for me. It's the kind of work that I really, really enjoy. The kind of work that feels like an investment in the garden's future, rather than a series of minutes leading to hours, leading to, to home time, which some gardening jobs can occasionally, occasionally feel like. I don't want to do gardening down, but it's, it's not all digging up olive trees. There is some sweeping up leaves involved as well. Luckily for you, I have editorial control over this podcast, so, so all of the leaf sweeping has been ignored, or in fact done, done by other people, so you won't hear anything about it. Anyway, enough of this introduction, let's get on with the week in gardening. Hello and welcome to the week in gardening. It is autumn, autumn 2020. A very, very exciting time of year for me and many other gardeners. Not just in terms of getting things done, more of which later, but in the, the very processes itself, in the things going on above our heads and, and next to our feet, in all of that oranging and yellowing. We are seeing incredibly, incredibly vital, important biological races being run. Plants are, are making huge, huge risks with every day. With every day they decide to, to keep those autumn-tinged leaves on or drop them. There is no right choice for these plants. And we can only sit beneath them in, in terror, wondering, will, will they make it? Is the gale going to come? 
we're seeing plants wondering, when do I go? When do I drop these leaves? Because I might still be able to photosynthesize. But then if I, if I leave it too late, I wouldn't have time to get all of my nutrients back from the leaves. All of that nitrogen and magnesium that I incredibly laboriously pumped out to, to make my chlorophyll. I need time to get that back. And if I leave it too late, then the wind will come and the cold will come and they'll freeze and blow my nutrients down into the gutters. Anyway, on Monday morning, I cycled in after a weekend of near continuous rain. It was incredible, that no, no rain like it. And it was dry for the first time in, in what felt like, like an age. And the waters were, were slowly beginning to retreat. I felt like I should have been piloting an ark instead of a, a little bicycle. There were the high points of the roads, right in the middle, away from the cambers that you could cycle over. And everything had been so thoroughly submerged that you really would expect to see clumps of seaweed and, and little starfish dotting the, the bus lanes. It was quite exciting. All of the people I saw, well, I didn't really see many people because it's dark when I'm cycling in, in the mornings, but, but that I imagined that they were sharing, gosh, we got through that kind of kind of looks with me certainly i nodded at some some other cyclists in the dark and wet and i hope they nodded back with the weekend in mind i pulled up to the garden with a sort of sense of dread wondering if we would have had a, a big flood in some of the clog points in some of the the bits of bed and lawn where where the contours build great great pools and there were there were some some bits of water but i think because because it'd been so wet in advance the ground is thoroughly spongy and soup like so it was letting water go through it wasn't like a, a summer downpour on dry and unresponsive ground so most of it seemed to have drained away the noreens are all out which was was very exciting they are they are looking incredibly Barbara Cartland pink. They are incongruous for the season. I was down in Cornwall uh, last week and they are great noreen growers in Cornwall. And you see them at this stage with the trees all bare and the leaves on the ground out in the gardens, clumped up, poked through, looking looking like something from a film set, as if someone's decided, well, maybe I'll shoot the new Willy Wonka film here. I'll just stick in some, some candy starburst plants that I've made up. That'll do. They're like a, a different bit of the universe that somehow got, got lost and ended up in, in early November in a woodland in England. Very exciting. I began by getting some planting done. I was planting a lot of Achillea. Achillea moonshine under the largest and most gnarled of the olives in the Mediterranean garden. And this is a story that, it almost sounds like a story that the Chelsea garden designers like to tell when someone tells you, where did you get the inspiration for this garden? And they talk about some, some sun-drenched holiday on the Aegean. Uh, this, is, this is what I did. I went to Greece a few years ago and loved, loved all of those olive groves with the wild carrots growing underneath in the heat and the dry and the little red squirrels scurrying between them to the, to the pine trees on the hill. And I wanted to recreate a bit of that. But uh, in, our, in our, our gloomy Chiltern skies, I don't think the the wild carrot would have had the same impact and I don't think that it would have taken over. The Mediterranean garden, for all of its hopeful name, doesn't have a particularly light and dry soil. We have wild carrots in the meadow where, where, where things are a bit better and a bit more baked, but the Mediterranean garden, actually, for all of the, the grit and stone mulch on it, still has a sludgy agricultural English bed of clay underneath it. So instead I've gone for, for Achillea moonshine. Achillea moonshine is that classic bright daffodil yellow Achillea. So it's got the umbilifer shape, but it has somehow more of a punch. It is going to be fighting against the grey cloud, not 
hiding from the pure blue sky. So I, I think we can get away with a bit more, a bit more heart, a bit more colour. It's much more of a slapstick kind of planting than you'd have in the, the, the sort of Peloponnesian orchards. But I think that we need to be a bit more obvious around here. And just like those Chelsea designers, you, you get the idea from nature and then you just make it unbearably, unbearably clear to everyone and in your face. I think it would look nice though over winter because we have that, that stone mulch, and then the leaves are going to be that same silver as the olive leaves. And then we'll hit summer and all of the kelly will come back into that, that perfect yellow flower, and all the lavender will come out and you'll have purple lavender and yellow achillea, which is one of those colour combinations that, that almost seems too easy. It seems like cheating a bit. I'm not particularly musical, but if I were in a band and were the lead songwriter, I imagine that after, after all my success, after my, my, my million sales and my platinum discs on the wall, I'd start to second-guess myself and say, those chords, they sound too good. They sound like... I'm just making music that people will like. Why am I doing that? I'm not saying anything. I'm going to make a concept album. I'm going to make everything for, from a synthesized noise from, from, from my shower tap. I'm going to run it through 18 different processes and, and make something that's really hard to listen to. And I think sometimes that I've been in gardening long enough that, that I start thinking, I need to make a hard plant. I need something that you have to think about to appreciate. And of course, that's a nonsense. I don't need to make kid a i need to make a, a good pop record occasionally so so i'm going to go for the obvious choice go for the purple and the yellow uh, and let people enjoy it next year on tuesday i turned the compost those those of you listening solely for the compost updates will be pleased to hear then a lot of scarifying a huge amount of scarifying with our new incredibly incredibly high powered and expensive 8,000 pound scarifier and so the heap is absolutely full of grass and grass bits. I think that it smells very lovely. It smells vegetably uh, and slightly rotten. It smells a little bit like a, a rocky shore at low tide, that sort of decaying seaweed smell, very evocative. But I think that that decaying seaweed smell is, is only a, a, a few hot unturned days from from a rotten silage smell also quite evocative and nice for, for for many people but probably not so readily appreciated so i'm going to keep it moving and keep some air in it which i did and then i went on to do some more rearranging of plants one of those jobs that you have been meaning to get around to for, for quite some time or i had been meaning to get around to for quite some time and then thought, well, I've got, I've got an hour and a half. I'll, I'll do it now. I need to cut back some salvia. So I went over and cut back the salvia. And once I'd cut back half of the salvia, I realised, well, actually, what's the point of cutting the salvia back? It's so ropey and old that actually it needs to be taken out. So then I stopped cutting back the salvia and I dug it out and, and chipped it and threw it away. And then you realise that the cistus next to it is also very sprawling and, and woody and it's letting so much light through its practically bare stems that there are a load of docks and dandelions hanging out in, it, in its protective embrace. And so the, the cistus gets dug out as well and digging it out, you realise... There are so many saponaria roots here. This is stupid. Why have I let the saponaria, the, the soapwort, take over to, to such a degree? You curse yourself a little bit for that and then decide that, oh, well, I've dug so much out. I might as well move these hybrid hellebores. I moved the hybrid hellebores because they were on the edge of the bed. And I think hybrid hellebores look silly next to grass. For some reason, they don't, they don't work. They look nice next to stone if you're next to a path, but um, otherwise, I don't think they should be out in the open next to grass. They should be they should be hunkered down under things in, in woodlandy bits. So then I dug those out and moved them under this big leggy mahonia 
chopping through all the little mahonia roots, which are bright yellow, like the like the mahonia wood generally, which is which is exciting. And then I found more saponaria roots in there when I was doing that. So I decided that I'd just dig the whole bed over and get rid of all the saponaria and then there was nothing left and it was just bare soil to, to be replanted completely and ah, i know i know a better a better gardener probably would have had it planned in and there would have been something on, on the whiteboard or, or on the on the the chart the gantt chart rearrange the bed but i just went to cut back the salvia and then had to do the whole the whole bed over again anyway this is the time to do that kind of thing. This is the time when you can say, no, hellebore, you go over there. No, you go that way. In the summer, you can't treat plants like that. They're all too fragile, all too just about alive. If you start disturbing roots, then they have a chance of, of drying out and dying. So you can't tell them to do anything, really. You've just got to live with them. It's like an army commander. We're in the military and we have a, a, a troop and this troop is completely and utterly useless. They're, they're ill-disciplined, they're, they're playing cards and smoking all day and not, not doing anything useful whatsoever. But you can't shout at them because they are very stressed, very, very stressed indeed. They've been in some awful, awful situations recently. And if you shout at them, they're just going to cry. They're going to cry and cry and cry. And you can't have that as an army commander, I imagine. So you wait until you're back in Earl de Shot or, or Salisbury Plain and they're back on the barracks and then you just shout at them and hit them and flog them and, and make them stand in the parade ground until they're back back where you want them. So that's what I've been doing to, to that bed. I think it's under control now. On Wednesday, I moved a large olive tree, not the olive tree with the Achillea, that would have been doing work unnecessarily. This is a different olive tree. I moved it out of the way of some new steps, some York stone curving steps that are coming down from, from an area of terracing into the garden. They are being built as we speak. It has a fairly small root ball for a large tree. Uh, well, it has one now. It didn't, didn't before we started digging it out, but, but a few roots, I think, are still there in the ground. So what once the thing came out, it looked a little bit un balanced it looked fairly heavy in the leaf department compared to the root department so i took out about a third of the canopy once i'd, I'd replanted it just so that it can't lose too much water for 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 the roots to, to take back in and i think that it'll benefit the the tree anyway we're rehabilitating this tree it suffered for for several years or maybe even decades from a sort of blobbing pruning regime where you come along and you you say right I'll, I'll turn this I'll turn this olive into a nice round blob because then I've done something and gardening is about doing things and so we got effectively a, a big hedge on a stick and I don't know how many of you stick your hands regularly into hedges I do as part of my job but you'll know that hedges are just boxes or balls full of full of twigs boxes full of twigs there's nothing more to them than a little skin of leaves over a, a bag of, of dried spaghetti like stuff and we don't want that certainly not from a tree we don't want that from our olive tree this 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 noble and, and ancient classical source of joy to us we don't want to turn it into a box of spaghetti twigs so we took out some of the branches in there, let some air and light in, and one day again it will, will be a tree, and it might even fruit. All of this fruit on, on new wood, like, like many, many plants. And if you clip them three times a year into an obsessive, compulsive little circle, then you take off all of the flowers and you, you never get any fruit. And that's, that's, not, that's not right. And it doesn't let the tree mature. It, it keeps it in a permanent adolescence that's going to to come and have a new life in an extra area of the garden and it can sit there happily and grow into a tree and produce the olives and and when climate change catches up to us and we are having the 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 Chilton Hills extra virgin olive oil first pressing it can be a, a part of it which would be lovely on Thursday I was at home 
looking after the little baby, which was a, a lovely day. And on Friday, I went back to work and I took apart a really rubbishy, rockery bank that has annoyed me for years. It's a slope and at some point I didn't think it was really thought about. It had been covered in rocks, which doesn't really make a rockery. It was like a sheet of paper covered in round pennies, if you can imagine that. All the rocks are round and of a very similar size and a single layer thick. And so you get a very regular pattern with little chinks in the corners between the, the, the pennies where you could try and fit a house leak or some other plant down into the, to the horrible subsoil below. And these plants never had a chance. Uh, it was a ridiculous, ridiculous way to do things. So it was taken to pieces and redone in a sort of spirit of geological homage. Gone is the gentle slope with its shell of, of stones on top, little helmet of stones. And now we have steep drops and, and muddy plateaus and planting pockets and all sorts of, all sorts of interesting shapes, basically. It's not really a classic alpine look I'm going for. I'm going for more of the, the sheltered valley that you might get on top of a mountain rather than that snow line, grit garden, alpine classical thing. The sort of thing that you might find on some high Andean paramo. So you're cold and, and wet and it's freezing, but fundamentally you're still on the equator. So, so where you can shelter from, from, from the wind and the mountain rain, you get these incredible, incredible pockets of lushness. All above is skin-soaking, high-speed, super-cool drizzle. And then you descend it behind a ridge and the wind is gone and all around the ground is, is blue and silver with wild lupins. That's the effect that I want on this little rockery in, in miniature scale. And to that effect, I've been planting silvery things. I've been planting lamb's ear, that wonderfully soft little, little plant, the stachys, and also been planting a bit of dwarf salvia, salvia nimorosa, and a few lupins in there as well. And hopefully it's going to work. It's it's sort of not a rockery anymore. It's a flower bed on an angle. The rocks are very, very, very heavy. And to get them from the bottom of the slope, which I wanted to do, to the top involved a very laborious process, boards and planks and rolling them down onto sack barrows and pallet trucks and then wheeling them on a half a mile circuit to, to reach the other path at the top of the garden and plonking them down so they, they have moved as the, the crow flies about four foot but have been on a journey like no other. And I'm really, really happy with the effect of moving these stones around. But I don't really know if that's because it's objectively much better or it's because I have invested all of this effort, all of this physical dragging effort and all of the, the emotional and imaginative effort of convincing myself that I've created an Andean paramo. And so I almost have to, to like what I've created. It's a terrible worry as a gardener because it's like being a parent. That that you love the things that are are yours automatically. So so, how can you tell if it's if it's any good? All the woes of a professional gardener. I think I've been reading so much about the um the the mindfulness benefits and the wellness benefits of, of gardening. I think it's because there's the um the book out um by by Thingamy Stuart Smith. And gardening is going to solve all of our problems and, and worries and cares. And I think, but I worry about plants all the time. I'm constantly worried. I'm constantly worried, well, did, did that work? Are they going to like that? I suppose that's because I have a job. I suppose if it's a, if it's a hobby, it's completely and utterly different. And all, all of you hobby gardeners out there, I do hope that you're, you're absolutely serene. And all of you professional gardeners, I, I hope that... <laughs> That like me, you occasionally roll your eyes and say, oh gosh, anyone who's woken up at four in the morning thinking, I've over that, that's not coming back in time. 
oh no i've ruined i've ruined christmas for everyone i hope that that you are are with me <laughs> and that you also feel these these stresses and and strains anyway enough enough of stress and strain this is not the the podcast for that let's see if i have any recommendations for you this week No recommendations this week, I'm afraid, but some thank yous instead. Uh, I'd like to say thanks once more to to Melanie. I'd also like to thank Becky and Julie Whitmer and the, the random Kovai supporter who didn't leave their name, but who sent me very, very lovely messages on there. If you want to join them, you can find that at, at, at kofi.com. That's K-O hyphen F-I dot com slash Ben Dark. And all of that is, is very, very much appreciated. I'd also like to thank the professional gardener. I, I won't name them, but um, but the professional gardener who got in touch, somebody who works at a, a similar private estate style gardening, suggesting that I, I come up and have a visit in the spring. What a wonderful idea. I've been in contact and so I'm going to go and, and look and find out how, how other people do it. I'd probably find out that I'm, I've been doing it completely, completely wrong for, for the last for the last however many years and, and get all sorts of, of new ideas. So so that was a really, really wonderful thing to do to reach out and and suggest that. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, if anyone else wants to to suggest a similar thing or or get in touch about anything, then they can reach me at the garden log podcast at gmail dot com. I'm going to go and make myself a cup of tea and look at the rain and think about my poor colleagues who are at work today, planting tulips and cutting back dahlias and doing doing real things. Nothing so so floppy as as making a a gardening podcast. Uh, so, so well done to them, and well done to to all of you for sticking around. I know it's been quite a long wait for this episode. Thank you very much for for your patience, and hopefully I will see you all back here again for episode number eighty five. For episode eighty five, goodness. Anyway, I'll see you for eighty five. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful time in your gardens or out of your gardens, in your armchairs, out of your armchairs, baths, or whatever you are doing to to pass November away. Until next time, thank you very much for listening, and goodbye. <laughs>